This morning we'll look at Mark chapter 1 verses 21 to 28 as Jesus enters the synagogue in Capernaum to teach. A demoniac approaches him and says, I know who you are. Jesus knows who he is as well, but he also knows who we are and he loves us. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this morning from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1. We're looking at verses 21 through 28, which was the Gospel lesson this morning. The theme is, I know who you are. That comes right out of the Gospel text this morning, if you were paying attention, and I know that you were. I know who you are. Where does that come from? And why is it important? That's what we want to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the authority and the power of Christ. And the recognition in the synagogue of Capernaum of that divine authority by an unlikely individual. And we're going to talk about how Jesus not only knows who that person is and who it is within him, but we're going to talk about how Jesus knows us as well. Last week we saw Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee up on the northwest shore near Capernaum calling four brothers, two families really, Andrew and Simon, James and John. And he took with him those men when he said, come follow me, and they left, immediately left everything, and they followed him. They went into the city of Capernaum. Jesus, having left Nazareth, now begins to center his ministry, his home, so to speak, for the ministry, in Capernaum. And he does now go on the Sabbath day to the synagogue. That synagogue is still there that Jesus taught in. An older synagogue is underneath it. A new one had been built on its foundation. And we learn in the scripture that it had been, that it had been paid for by a, a um, centurion of the Romans, a God-fearing man who was stationed in that area. The walls, the foundation, many of the columns are still there. In fact, archaeologists are talking today about rebuilding that structure it's so well built, so much of it, is, of it is standing today. Jesus went in there, his, his uh, reputation preceding him. And as was the custom with the visiting rabbi, he was inv invited to come up and to speak a word to the people to teach. But Jesus' teaching, you see, was unlike anything they had ever heard. Today we're accustomed to speaking the Word of God and hearing it expounded upon and explained and applied back then. The rabbis, and I think still today, don't talk so much of the Word, the Law and the Prophets. They talk about the Word, the Law and the Prophets. And so they would refer to the traditions of the elders and the wise sages of old as they commented on different portions of the scripture and they would give their own interpretation. And what usually came out was an ethical or moral presentation based around the word of God. But this morning Jesus comes to the synagogue and doesn't talk about the word he teaches the word. He presents the word and he tells people what it means. And he doesn't apply to other great rabbis of the past and other knowledgeable individuals. But he does this on his own authority. And the powerful preaching of Christ with such power that the gospel is proclaimed probably for the first time in the synagogue and the people marvel at what they hear. It says they're amazed, they're astonished. Because this Jesus is teaching like someone who has authority. The very authority of God himself. Well, why shouldn't he, right? After all, he is 
the Christ. He is the Son of God. He has exactly what the Father has told him to say. And not only that, he knows the Father's will from all eternity as he shares it with God's people on this Sabbath morning. But, surprise of surprises, one of the congregants sitting in the synagogue that day was possessed by an evil spirit. As Jesus is teaching, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, with us, Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I know who you are. Isn't it interesting that the witness to Christ should suddenly appear from a man possessed by an unclean spirit? Now, an unclean spirit in the scripture means one which is impure, obviously. One which is evil. A devil or a demon are the equivalents. The man is demon possessed. And he doesn't have to be told, nor does he have to guess who this man is teaching in the synagogue because the demons know that God is present. They know that he is the word encased in flesh, the word which has come to explain the very word of God to the people of God. James tells us that even the demons know who God is, and they shudder. Well, it would seem like this would be an ideal witness, perhaps, if we're looking at it superficially. After all, doesn't Jesus want to have people recognize him as the Messiah, the Son of God? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. It appears to be a witness to Christ, but that's not what it all is, it? Who wants a demon to witness to them? Certainly not Jesus. What does the demon say? Why does the demon say that? Shouldn't Jesus let him alone and let the demon proclaim who he is? Of course not. Of course not. Because the demon doesn't have in mind to confess and witness to Jesus. Demons are impure. Demons are evil. Demons are malicious and malevolent. The demon has in mind to hinder the proclamation of the gospel for the people of God. What does Jesus do? He turns to the man. Jesus knows who he is. And he says, be muzzled, be silent. Muzzles him like an ox. He cannot but obey the Son of God. And then he says to him simply, come out. And the demon leaves him. But not until the demon convulses him in physical spasms and shrieks as it leaves. Everybody knew what was going on. Everybody knew this was a demoniac. Is it surprising, I wonder, that we should find people possessed by Satan in the synagogues? Do we think sometimes that Satan grabs these people and he keeps them at home, they sleep in, they go to the golf course or whatever, they aren't in church on Sunday mornings? Let's not be deceived, but we should be warned, perhaps. When everything is false doctrine, Satan is quiet. He has no reason to fear. But when the word of God is proclaimed, law and gospel, and the gospel is being taught, Satan, when he is present, has strife and anxiety over that, and he wants to prevent it. It's true what they say where Christ builds his church, Satan builds his chapels. And if he's not working to create conflict, he's there behind the scenes, whispering and encouraging and twisting and turning. We shouldn't be surprised. But Jesus knows who he is. And in the text today, 
We note that Jesus first speaks to the demon, calling him to be quiet and to come out of him. And when the, he comes out, he speaks or addresses the man. There are two things here. That evil spirit shook the man. So while the demon is in the man and the man is possessed by the demon, they appear to be one, but Jesus sees them as two and separates them. Why does he do that? Why does he do that? Because he loves everyone in that synagogue just as much as he loves you and me here in church today. Jesus knows who we are this morning. Jesus knows us by name. In his love he has created us. And he knows that in our human nature, we don't like to be told that we don't measure up. He knows that in our human nature that we don't like it when we're told that we cannot merit our way, that salvation is not about our merit, but Christ's merit. He knows our human nature struggles with sin every single day. That's who we are in this fallen and sinful world. But that's not who he intends us to be. And so as he reaches out with the power of his authority and commands the evil spirit, so he comes to us as well with the power and the authority of his word and of his sacraments and by the miracles that he creates within the gathering of his people. We behold the miracle of faith in the water of baptism. We behold the miracle of his body and blood in with the bread and wine for our salvation, the forgiveness of our sins. We behold the miracle of the power of the word as it works within us to keep us in Christ, to tether us to salvation that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him. And he knows who you are. And he knows who I am. And despite my weakness my inability to measure up despite my estrangement from God. He loves me anyway. And he loves you. And he went to the cross for us. Jesus struggled with Satan in the wilderness and overcame Satan goes wherever Jesus goes. He knows why Christ is here. The salvation of your souls. He has a love for all the world. And he has sent us into that world. And you and I will, as we go, run into obstacles as the demon throwed before Christ today. But Christ goes with us. And at every turn, Christ defeats Satan. And no matter how hard he may attack Christ in his church, he and his church will stand. And the largest and greatest and fiercest attack came at Christ when he hung on the cross. And even as Jesus bowed his head for you and died. He won the victory. Sin, your sin and mine. Death, the end of all natural life in this world. And the power of Satan himself was destroyed. And to prove it, he stood up for the grave and he lives and he is with us every day to the very end of the age when he appears in the sky with the angelic host to bring us to be with God forever. He knows who you are. And now the challenge comes for us today to live in that word. 
to be tied to that word. Yes, Satan is going to try and nudge you away from Christ, away from the word, away from the sacraments, away from his church. But as God enables us to remain in that word, our faith is nourished and enriched and grows stronger and stronger. So that when Satan comes to us with his temptations, as pleasing as they may seem, his empty and deadly promises, we can say with Christ, get behind me, Satan. And he will flee from the gospel. He will flee from the word within you. He has no power over you. For Christ has defeated him. It's interesting that Jesus confronts in the first miracle of St. Mark a demoniac. Because the power and authority of the divine and living word of God, Jesus himself, is present in the synagogue at Capernaum. And his word, that same word, is present here in North Richland Hills today. It is present wherever you go. It is present because Christ goes with you. So as you leave the doors of our sanctuary today and go back to the world and the life and the vocations that Christ has called you to live and fulfill, do so with joy, with confidence, and the assurance that because he knows you and has given you the gift of faith and you trust in that cross and that empty tomb and the Savior who died there, by these things, you also know him. You know him. You know he is with you. And you know he will never leave you. Because in the end, the power and the authority of our Christ reigns supreme. May God strengthen you in the reassurance of his love, in the powerful message of his word. And may God enable you to live that word each day and to carry it with you so that you, in his love, may share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to hear more on this or any other topic, please find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net. Please join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., Bible class and Sunday school at 10.30 a.m.